essential oils 101. I'm just going to go over a couple of quick housekeeping items before I introduce our guest speaker for the night. Um, so if you have signed up for tonight's event, shortly after you will receive an email, and that is a quick survey. The, the survey is going to ask you a few questions, and then we are going to ask you for your physical mailing address, and that is because you are eligible for a nutrition buck, as seen here. And a nutrition buck is $10 off if you spend $50 or more in store, and that you can spend that on sale items as well. Um, so please look for that email and then um, please give us your information and we will send you that nutrition buck by mail. Uh, we are very excited to be offering nutrition tours again. This is a one-on-one -on -one nutrition education session with one of our nutrition team. You can sign up to do that online, it is free. So our website is choicesmarkets.com or you can also sign up in store uh, at customer service. And lastly, we are going to be having a chat box and you can submit your questions through there. So you do need to sign into a YouTube account to take part in the chat. Uh, if you don't have a YouTube account, it's really easy. Just sign up now, log in, and that way you can ask your questions and I will read them at the end of the event to our presenter. So with that, I am going to read our presenter's bio. Talia has been a life or sorry, has had a lifelong passion for all things nutrition and healthy living. With over 30 years in the health industry, her formal training, as well as her personal and professional experience, form a strong basis for her speaking and education. Her experience includes an eclectic background in herbal medicine, nutrition, essential oils, green living, meditation, vegetarian cooking, and working as a wellness coach fitness instructor, and personal trainer. Talia is also an author, the author of The Confident Food Shopper, The Guide to Food Labels and Fables, The Expert Patient, Health is Not a Spectator Sport, and The Three-Minute Liquid Meal Blueprint. So with that, I would like to welcome you, Talia. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I'm going to jump right in and... Uh introduce the now brand um, who I'm here on behalf of just as a, by way of a quick introduction this is our core family now is family owned 55 years uh, hard to believe and this is just a great book you can read online if you're ever interested in knowing the background of the now family um, it's a, a one hour read and just one of the unique things about now is that we um, own and operate eight in-house laboratories, do an average of 16,000 tests every month. So that's going to include on the essential oils. And it's actually quite rare for uh, supplement um, companies to own their own labs. Um, so that means we can test every lot and we know a lot about quality and sourcing. All right. And then, of course, the obligatory disclaimer, um, the presentations, as you know, are always for general informational purposes. Doesn't mean they won't be fun, though, and does not constitute the practice of medicine or aromatherapy. So any use of information written or stated here or materials linked is at the user's own risk. That, of course, includes for questions answered at the end, which I do welcome. Um, and no shared recipes are meant to replace medical advice, of course. So for all suggested uses, doses, and cautions of products, you can look at the products in the lovely store that you can visit at Choices or by visiting nowfoods.ca. And also, of course, ask their knowledgeable staff. All right, so jumping right into essential oils, I hope that uh, you know by the end of this evening, especially if you're new to essential oils, you really feel comfortable now that you can safely embark on this journey with essential oils because a huge part of what I, uh, I study and make sure that I know is the safety because there's just so much misinformation out there about essential oils. Uh, so I want to make sure that you're enjoying them, but safely. So we'll have recipes and how to use and all kinds of stuff. So you're going to learn what are essential oils, uh, the safe use of essential oils, what makes good quality essential oil, just to be, debunk some myths out there uh, about use and safety. And of course, you're here for practical tips and recipes. I know that. So don't worry. We'll get to that. 
Um, so aromatherapy, if you've heard of that as a, as a kind of a word or catchphrase, it's just the use of essential oils from plants. You can get actually essential oils from all parts of the plants, flowers, herbs, or trees. Um, as some type of therapy to improve your well-being, physical, mental, or spiritual. We can all, or most of us can relate to how great we feel when we smell that morning coffee. That's right there. That is aromatherapy. Um, and essential oils are, you know, they're extracts from plants. They're a mixture though specifically of what we call volatile organic compounds. Volatile just means that they're, they're parts of the plant that are so light that they easily, just even at room temperature, will uh, evaporate into the air so that they make their way to our nose and we can smell them. So if you ever smell a flower or plant or cut grass, that's volatile oils. And they've been separated using a specific process that's now known, uh, it's called distillation. And that essentially is uh, what it is to make an essential oil. Now in a plant, they have certain uses for that plant. They attract pollinators, they repel bugs that they don't want, so protect the plant, but then we extract them and concentrate them and use them for our own uses. And I won't bore you with a lot of history, but it, it is important to know that essential oils do have a long history across you know, many continents and many different cultures, but the modern distillation technology, which we now use, was invented by Arabic pioneers 1200 AD. So I have to give them credit. Now extraction methods for essential oils. If you uh, look, for example, on uh, a bottle of, I'm going to speak to the now essential oils, because that's what I know. If you look on the bottle, we'll tell you how the essential oil was made. For the majority of them, it's going to say steam distilled. Uh, that is the process used. I don't remember if I, okay, I don't have a, a, a slide showing how, but with steam distillation, so you just have some uh, hot steam and because they're easily, they're volatile, they will go up and they're light and volatile and they'll leave the rest of the plant components that are heavier behind and then they get condensed. And that's what essential oils basically are, or how they're made. But some, uh, for some things like citrus, they are made with cold pressing. And so those are just a little less pure because they contain resins or waxes, not just the volatile oils. That's, you'll see citrus is definitely going to be cold pressed most of the time. There are some other um, essential oils, I'm putting in quotes, that are solvent extracted. So they have to use something. The, uh, in the now line, that would just be jasmine or rose. And the reason that sometimes you have to use an alternative uh, means is because some plants are just too delicate. It would be impossible to, to not uh, destroy the delicate plants using with steam distillation. Um, and technically, those are not considered essential oils, but they'll be in the same bottles. They look the same, but on the label, it will say absolute rather than essential oil. So that's what that means. Jasmine or rose absolute means that they have been uh, extracted with this kind of a more gentle process. And we have one essential oil of all of ours, the vanilla, that is extracted using a carbon dioxide. That's just because some plants have different properties that make it uh, difficult to use the typical steam distillation. So that's a little bit of background in the extraction. And then when it comes to, you know, essential oils, we receive them in different ways and different routes. Do they, they can enter the body, also use them for our environment, our floors and such. But uh, when we inhale or when they're in the air, uh, they can go into the nose. And we actually do have evidence that they can stimulate uh, many receptors in the nose and then send signals to different parts of the brain, uh, including uh, more 
primitive parts of our brain, the amygdala that can affect our emotions or moods. And there's even some studies showing certain essential oils like citrus essential oils can affect our mood. Um, and then of course, if you inhale, a lot of it can go into the lungs and actually very quickly, because they're small particles, very quickly and easily cross from the lungs into the bloodstream. So you do get essential oils going into your body, even if you're putting them topically because they evaporate. If you can smell them, some of them have gone into your lungs. Um, and then of course, there's the you know, oral root by mouth, which I will get to, and we can put them on our skin. We absorb about five to 10% of the essential oils. It's really going to depend. So some of that also will, you know, will penetrate into the layers of the skin. Some of it will make its way into our bloodstream. And a lot of it will just evaporate off the skin as well. So those are all the roots. Now uh, let's get into the safe use of essential oils. All right. So these are some like really basic uh, safety steps that I do want to get out of the way. Keep them away from your eyes, ears, mucous membranes, like the nose, mouth. Um, these are very delicate and essential oils can be irritants. Keep the oils tightly closed. That's to really protect. You've invested money in them. They're going to last longer, but also because you don't want kids opening them, pets knocking them over. And even when you're using them, as soon as you put the drops, put the lids back on because air, um, you know, the oxygen will start to accelerate their deterioration. Keep them out of the reach of children and pets, obviously. Uh, never use, and I'll get into a lot more detail, never use undiluted oils on your skin, despite what you may see all over social media of people just taking the bottles and rubbing them right on. Patch test oils. Um, before you. So, you know, put them on a small part of your skin rather than all over and wait up to 24 hours to make sure that you don't react to it. It's just good practice. And same with even if you're making something to clean, say, your kitchen counter and you've never used it, do a little patch test in an area that's not so visible and wait. Um, never apply photosensitivity oils in the sun. So I will get to that too. The certain essential oils that don't combine well with the sunlight. And if pregnant or nursing, consult a healthcare provider before using, which it says on every bottle anyway. So essential oils are natural, but in the concentrations that we find them, that is not natural in the sense that it doesn't occur in nature in those concentrations. So we have to respect that and therefore learn certain uh, safety um, approaches. But just to give you an idea, it takes about 150 of these lemon rinds here just to make one bottle of lemon essential oil. So you wanna just be careful and also never waste them. And it takes about, this is approximation, 20 to 25 tea bags of peppermint tea, if you were steeping, uh, would give you the equivalent of one drop of the peppermint essential oil. So again, just to drive home that point of how concentrated they are. Now, the reason I'm showing this is because all of, uh, this is because of misinformation online, but all of these essential oils here that I'm listing of the now essential oils um, could qualify as food grade in the sense that they could be used because not all essential oils can ever qualify as food grade, but these ones do, which means that they could be used as flavoring agents in foods as Health Canada uh, recognizes that, but that doesn't mean we can take the bottle and drop it in our mouth. No, what Health Canada says is these could be used, but they have to be extremely diluted, normally in parts per million. So lemon has to be at 230 parts per million to qualify to be in a food and made in a facility that makes foods. So that is the definition. Sometimes you might hear out there someone saying, 
oh, you can put this essential on your mouth because this is better quality than others. It's food grade. And that is just a myth. Um, these ones, the now essentials are food grade, but they are not uh, regulated and not safe to put straight in the mouth. Um, so I will get a little more uh, to that in a minute. And this kind of, this is a picture online, this kind of practice dropping an essential oil into a glass of water is not safe. Uh, so don't do that. And um, this is the International Federation of Professional Aromatherapists even says on their website, they do not endorse taking essential oils via ingestion or any other internal route. And they don't even recognize that for the, um, for the diploma programs that they um, a credit for the schools. All right, and you can certainly ask me questions at the end uh, about that. In terms of phototoxicity and essential oils, it's good to know that there's certain essential oils, they tend to be the citrus ones, but they may not always be obvious because there's certain, um, uh, we all know that grapefruit and orange are citrus, but you might not know some of these other ones. So. When you think citrus think could be phototoxic, meaning if you put it on your skin and you go out even uh, 12 hours or maybe even uh, longer, like 24 hours later, it can make you much more prone to sunburn. Um, so know these ones well before you apply something topical, make sure that it's not one that is phototoxic. And it does depend a little bit, or does depend on how that essential oil is made which is interesting. So you'll notice here that, um, for example, cold pressed lemon essential oil is phototoxic, but steam distilled is not. And that's just because um, of the, you know, the different processing and you get these different end products. So um, I won't go into too much detail, but that's enough to say, but most of the citrus are uh, not steam distilled, as I mentioned. They're generally citrus is gonna be cold pressed. So just keep that in mind. And then also another thing is risk of sensitization. Sensitization is something, it's a kind of a word often used with essential oils. It really just means a development of an allergy on the skin. And there's certain essential oils that that's more likely to happen with than others including common ones like lavender and tea tree. And I'm again telling you this because you will see uh, people uh, a lot online just showing you to apply essential oils undiluted onto their skin. And that is really one of the biggest risk factors for the development of these allergies or sensitization is not properly diluting them. So if you just uh, use common sense and apply what you learned tonight, you should be fine for the most part. But these are the risk factors for sensitization. One of them is using high doses. And by high doses, I mean you know, un either undiluted or not diluted enough. So it's really helpful to learn how to dilute your essential oils properly. And I'm gonna show you that as we go on. Also repeated use could be using something again and again, day after day on the skin. So it's sometimes generally recommended to rotate your essential oil that you're using on your skin. Applying oxidized oils, which basically means ones that are old, they're not fresh, especially the citrus. Um, which is why it's important to keep the lids on. And if something's past the best buy date, don't put it on your skin, even if it's properly diluted. And if you have sensitive skin, uh, broken skin, that's also a risk factor. Uh, so we do have on the uh, bottom of our bottles, these best buy dates. And that is, I often get asked about that. It's just, it's an approximate, uh, based on the testing that we do. So we do in-house testing. We do like accelerated conditions of oxygen and heat and, and come up with those dates. A lot of essential oils, if you treat them well, can 
last you two years, three years, there's even some that can last as long as, as eight years, they have different shelf life, but they're based on reasonable practices, which means that they're assuming that you're following good practices, uh, not keeping them in the hot, steamy bathroom, not keeping them in direct sunlight. So it's just good to keep your essential oils in a, in a cupboard, kind of in a cool, dark place, keep the lids on as much as you can, you can even keep them in the refrigerator and it's not a bad idea for those citrus ones which tend to oxidize more quickly, but you don't have to. Um, and increase risk of sensitization again, if you're using old essential oils. And with regards to pregnancy, I just wanted to say that um, it does say again on every bottle always to ask somebody before using with pregnancy or lactation. And I do recommend that, but uh, I did list here some essential oils that should never, ever, ever be used in pregnancy, no matter what. So I don't think anyone would tell you to use them if you went and saw them uh, like aromatherapist. Uh, but there are some that are, are clearly dangerous. And there are some studies of uses for essential oils during pregnancy. So they, for example, lemon diffused for morning sickness. Uh, so there is a possible role, just get some good advice. And here's just a list of essential oils that are generally safe for healthy children. And by healthy children, I mean, you know, they don't get sick a lot more than other kids, don't have asthma or allergies, that sort of thing. So um, there's a list here at nowfoods.ca that shows these essential oils. If you just kind of, you want to diffuse some around the house or something, and you're just not sure where to start because you have kids. So that's just a, a list of some that are on the safer side. And we also have a list uh, here. Um, this can be downloaded and printed. So I just made it larger of safety guides for kids. There's certain essential oils that you uh, shouldn't use in, with certain age brackets. So that's what we've just got here on the website. So for example, for someone, if you have a child that's three years and under, you want to definitely avoid this list here around kids. Um, now, an important note though, is this list and all of these here only apply to the line of now essential oils, not to all essential oils possibly available out there because we don't carry everything, although we have an extensive line. And if you have pets, and you also, so I gotta have just a sip of water here. And you also like to use essential oils, then it's good to know a little bit about safety around pets. Uh, now I'm not a veterinarian and there's a lot we don't know honestly about essential oils, even in people, but pets too. So, uh, but I am, I have listed here some helpful resources. These are good websites that provide at least as much as we know and give you a lot of good, sensible advice, uh, some for dogs, some for cats. There are products, existing products made that such as like a flea and tick spray. This is an example that I found and that have been approved. And so those would be safe and they're going to be really, really diluted and certain ones that are appropriate for a certain animal. So if that's okay. But in terms of for your own, I would consult with a veterinarian. Definitely look at these websites. Um, some general information about pet safety. So caution is always advised when diffusing in the presence of a pet. And if you don't know what diffusing is, you can see in the background there, I have a diffuser and the, those are the essential oils coming up in the mist. Um, so here are some simple steps. Concentrated essential oils should never be intentionally given to an animal to ingest or applied topically unless directed by veterinarian. Ensure diffusers are used in an open, well-ventilated area of the home. So, you know, you don't have your like pet in the back of your car and diffusing in your little car. If diffusing for the first time around a pet, carefully monitor them. That makes sense. See how they look. Are they acting strangely? Are they coughing? Uh, ensure your pet has free access to other areas of your home. If you uh, diffuse and the aroma 
comes too strong for them, at least they can move out of the area. Never leave a diffuser uh, running and a pet unattended. And then um, a couple of essential oil extracts here that are, are commonly used um, with lavender and citrus or in citrus-based products. These constituents have been associated with severe dermatitis in some animals, especially cats. So just an extra warning there. And also know if you have birds, they are ultra sensitive. That's why we have the, you know, the term, the canary in the coal mine. People used to send a canary down into the coal mine to see if it was safe for everyone else because birds are so sensitive. If that bird would drop dead, then they knew it wasn't safe for people. It's terrible, but anyway, that will um, bring home the point. And cats cannot detoxify the same way as dogs or humans do. So, so for cats versus dogs, cats are more sensitive. So also be aware of that, lovely kitties. Um, here's just a list I got from one of those websites of, you know, you should limit your cat's exposure to these particular essential oils. But they do say that, you know, it, take this with a grain of salt because we don't test essential oils on animals to see if they're safe or not, uh, you know, on our cats and dogs. So all of this information coll collected has just been uh, most of it because either pet has been brought into the emergency room because of exposure or just some basic understandings about certain essential oils and, um, you know, and, and they don't take into account your own pet and the health of your pet, the size of your pet and, um, you know, how small is the room you're diffusing in and such. So just, just be aware, that's all. All right, and then um, for quality of essential oils, um, one, of, one of the things that we've been doing it now over the past, uh, I think like, three, four years is testing some online brands of different uh, supplements and such, including we started doing it with essential oils. Um, none of the companies we're testing are, are our friends and competitors that you'll see in the health food store. These are just kind of more obscure brands online off Amazon that seem to be um, you know, suspiciously inexpensive or something like that. And so we, we did, uh, the first one we did was uh, took a whole bunch of essential oils and 12 out of the 18 essential oils that we tested, most of them were lavender, failed to meet just basic, um, basic profile testing. Like they were the wrong species or they had extra contaminants or maybe added ingredients that were meant to smell or appear to be lavender but weren't. Uh, so there's a, a, a lot of issues when it comes to quality, essential oils. Um, and if you, know, if you want to understand how do you know if an essential oil is good quality, there is no uh, mystery to how you test and identify a good pure essential oil. It's well known internationally. And so these kind of tests that I'm showing you here, and these are in our labs, are the basic tests that are done for quality. Um, this one here where I put the fingerprint gas, gas chromatography is really a key one. Uh, a lot of these tests act like a fingerprint. So for example, if you gave a fingerprint um, and then, you know, somebody, and then you wandered off and you went somewhere else and someone wanted to find you, but they didn't know what you looked like. They could take your finger and test and compare them. And if it was identical, they go, ah, okay, yes, we have the right person. So that's sort of what uh, this sort of test does. It will show, is this in fact lavender? Is it the right species of lavender? Is it the right plant part of lavender? Does it have anything else in it? And there's also tests for uh, heavy metals, pesticides, and even the old fashioned, you know, smelling that can also tell us a lot. And we're also, um, we're very transparent. So you can go online and you can see the test results for every single essential oil. This is the fingerprint of what it looks like for some of these tests, uh, which is interesting. And someone with a lot of experience will look at this and go, oh yeah, yes, I, I know that's definitely Atlas Cedar. 
Uh, so you can have a look at those if you're interested. A interesting thing to note about heavy metals, actually one of the great things about essential oils is you aren't likely to find any heavy metals or it's not going to be a concern. And the reason is, this is just showing a, a test result of 10 distilled essential oils. Um, these, this range of amount that could be found is so minuscule um, and it's way, 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 way below even what, say, in the USA, they would allow to be in a lipstick. And the reason for that is because heavy metals are heavy. That's why actually they're named that way. They're heavy molecules, whereas the essential oils are volatile and light. So they lift up and evaporate and leave behind all the stuff that's heavier of the plant material, including any heavy metals. Uh, with pesticides, there's also an advantage to essential oils because uh, they tend to come from plants that are very aromatic, and those aromatics are used as natural deterrents for pests in the first place. So essential oils come from plants that don't tend to need a lot of pesticides at all. So they tend to be very low, and that's been shown like in, in many, many tests uh, in North America, in Europe with essential oils. This is um, something I just wanted to mention as sort of circulating myths. You might hear terms used about certain essential oils that they're therapeutic grade or they're medical grade or they're aromatherapy grade. Any of these terms are certainly said to try to distinguish some essential oils as being better than others. Um, so the reason I wanna mention them tonight is because uh, it's good to know that these terms don't have any technical meaning. They're just marketing terms. In other words, they're misleading. Um, now, therapeutic grade does have a meaning, but when you say therapeutic grade, it means that there's this out there, this existing third-party pharmacopoeia or a, this statutory organization, and they have created these this detailed what we call a monograph that describes what qualifies as therapeutic grade and anyone who meets those standards and proves they meet those standards can then say they have therapeutic grade. So the term exists, but in the essential oil world, there is no such third party. And so therefore that uh, those terms shouldn't be used. So um, you wanted to just refer back to the test that I showed you and that is how you know you have a good quality essential oil. All right. Now we get to the, this is the practical part. Get your, uh, get your hands in the essential oils, not if they're not diluted. So um, I keep mentioning dilute, dilute, dilute. So I have to tell you now, how do we safely dilute essential oils? Also a lot of incorrect information online. So this slide is really important. Basically, there's two effective ways really to dilute essential oils uh, safely. In order to dilute them safely, you have to put them in something that they are able to mix in. So if you look here, if you drop essential oils into a glass of water, they don't mix in water. They're not soluble. So they'll just clump together and therefore that is not a safe way to mix essential oils. The two very effective ways is either in a very high percentage of alcohol, which most of you are probably not going to be using, but aficionados out there who want to make essential oil, say room sprays uh, or perfumes may use these um, high percentage alcohols. And I actually do, but I just buy the, that cheap um, the alcohol from the drugstore, which does work perfectly fine if you don't mind the, the smell of that pure alcohol. Um, but the one that's gonna be most practical for, for you is carrier oil. Carrier oil is just a fancy word for oil that helps to carry that essential oil. So it could be like any cooking oil you use, that's an oil, but you can be more selective about ones that you wanna put on your body. Um, so I'll get to that with some examples. There are a lot of online recipes showing vodka to use. And I'll, I'll show you in a picture coming up because the alcohol content of vodka is not high enough. It doesn't really work all that well. It's okay if it's an air spray, again, if you're not putting it on your body, if something doesn't perfectly mix 
just shake it vigorously. Um, and all of these were, are in a lot of recipes and they, they don't work. Vegetable, glycerin, um, some people have been really harmed. Putting their essential oils in full fat milk because there are recipes out there saying you can put that then in the bathtub, but that doesn't work, unfortunately. I did a little, and you can watch the video online, I demoed here. So this is what I sometimes use to make my perfumes. It's just cheap alcohol, but it's 99%. I put a blue colored chamomile essential oil into this alcohol, which was mixed with water, and you can see it mixed beautifully. I used vodka on the other side, and you can see it did disperse a bit because it's not all clumped together, but it's nowhere near as good as uh, completely mixed into this. So now carrier oil I mentioned. So carrier oil is any oil, but these are three that are you know very versatile. Grapeseed oil, which is maybe one of the less expensive ones, especially if you're making stuff, say for massage to go all over the body and you're using a lot of it. Jojoba oil, which is actually technically a wax. Jojoba is lovely. I put it on my face, on my body. Um, and uh, yeah, it just has a, a, a beautiful texture because it's actually a wax. It's got a lot of what's called um, ceramides in it which is kind of a buzzword now in the cosmetic industry that helps to solidify or create a better barrier in our skin to keep water in so it doesn't evaporate, so or hydration. And liquid coconut oil is also wonderful. And here's just a, a chart, which you know we do have online. Um, I'm not sure actually, I have a whole bunch of links at the end that you can go online and find these different charts and things I'm showing you. So hopefully there'll be a way uh, for them to be shared with you. Uh, if not, it will be on the slide and you can take a picture of it as you're rewatching this video. Um, but this is just to give you an idea for all the different kinds of carrier oils. Are they good for normal dry skin, oily skin, mature skin, depending on how you're using them? Uh, that may help you decide what you might want to use. Now, I haven't gotten into what are good amounts of dilution, but I will. But just um, wanted to let you know there's some great resources to help you make your own DIY products without having to be a math whiz. Now, this, this is all at nowfoods.ca. So we have this topical application dilution chart. This is just an easy one. So you will say you have a container that's 60 milliliters large and you want to make a 2% dilution. So put 2% of essential oil into that carrier oil. Then you will, so here's you, you're using a 60 ml container and you're, you want a 2% dilution. So where those two lines meet, 24 drops of essential oils will be added into that container. Then you fill up the rest with your carrier oil and there you have a 2% dilution. So you can use that chart, but it is limited. Maybe you have container that's five ml or really large. So we also have this amazing calculator. You can set the, the measurement units that you're using, say milliliters. Enter the size of your bottle, whatever it is. Enter the desired dilution you want. Just click calculate and boom, tells you how many drops to put in that container to make whatever dilution you want. So this makes it really easy. Um, now safe dilution uh, varies according to, uh, each essential oil has a different safe dilution. So it will depend on the type of essential oil you're using. Some are much gentler like lavender oil and others like cinnamon are really, really tricky to work with and the quality so that, you know, they're not too old. Frequency of application, skin sensitivity, surface area makes a difference. You're putting something on the whole body versus just in a little spot, then the dilutions might change and the body part. So we don't use the same dilution on the face as we would use on the body. 
Now, online, there's a great um, website, the Tisserand Institute. That's actually where I took my advanced course in safety for essential oils through them. They've published a whole textbook on essential oil safety. So they're a really good, responsible organization and good place for information on safety. But I summarized here for you their general safety guidelines for dilution. Um, so now this is for adults. So they're saying, you know, if you're putting on your face or if it's a body oil, or if it's going to go in the bath, if you're just using it as a spot treatment, you know, for a wound or acne, um, then these are the ranges of the dilutions that are generally going to be used and uh, just the common percentage. So on the face, it's common to use just a 1% dilution of essential oils, body and lotions a bit higher, in bath or body products a bit higher. And maybe if you're, you know, if you see aromatherapist and they're treating a condition like knee pain or, or acne, and you're just putting out little spots, they're gonna use a higher percentage. But these are general. So that's why I got this big disclaimer here. Um, because not all essential oils are safe to use topically, and some of them need to be diluted even more than this. It, it just depends. So they're general guidelines. And they also provide general guidelines for, you know, for kids or going from age from birth to 15 plus. Um, you got to be really cautious with these. But since they're publicly available on their website, I did want to include them. She is adorable. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind again, that uh, not all of these are safe, not all essential oils are safe to use. And I wouldn't use essential oils yourself unless you're seeing a specialist and aromatherapist on children of this age anyway. So this is what I created um, here, you, looking at the now essential oils, and we have a big variety, so it should cover a lot to show you um, these charts. These essential oils here have no maximum dilution, meaning that they need to be diluted because I've already said you always have to dilute essential oil, but um, there's no specific detail you need to know about how much you should dilute it because they're fairly gentle. So if you followed those general guidelines that I just showed you from the Tisserand Institute, so if you took any one of these um, and made like a 1% dilution on something you put on your face or a 2% something you put on your body, uh, for most people, you're probably going to be pretty fine because they're really, really gentle. But there's other essential oils here that have, these are their that do have very specific maximum dilutions. Now, maximum dilution means this is the very upper end you can use them for most people, after which you're probably going to get in trouble, reaction, a sensitivity, and such. The maximum safe dilutions do not mean that they are the recommended um, dilutions. I just want to make that clear the general recommended dilutions I went over on the other slides, but it means these are the maximum. So if you see cinnamon here, the maximum dilution is 0.01%, which means that it should be used significantly lower than that. And that's very, very, very dilute and will be very difficult to even make a product. So I just wouldn't even use cinnamon on the body. And I've had a bad reactions with cinnamon twice because I walked into an essential oil store once. And um, this was actually in Vancouver. Can't remember the store. And this very lovely lady, she was so excited. Oh, let me show you. She took cinnamon here. I love this. And she just right on my arm went like this straight. And within about seconds, my whole arm was red and I had to run off and try to find a bathroom. <laughs> so that's how quickly I reacted to cinnamon. So I, I learned the hard way. Um, so, you know, start with a list like this of really more gentle essential oils to work with if you're going to be applying them uh, to the body. Diffusion of essential oils. So um, now it's got a lot of lovely diffusers and this can be a great way, one of the safest ways and easiest ways really to enjoy essential oils. Because for most of us, we just want to create some ambience, mood. Um, 
So um, these particular types of diffusers are called ultrasonic. And that means that uh, for one, that they don't heat up. So that's really nice because that's just a cool steam. There's no heat, no risk of burning. If, uh, you know, if, if a kid came nearby, knocked it over, it's not going to be hot. Uh, or, you know, if the steam was near their face. They do automatically shut off too, in case you leave them. They're easy to clean, although just general advice with um, diffusers in general is because citrus, as I mentioned, they're usually cold pressed and it has some waxes and resin. They can clog up the diffusers. So you wanna clean them well with alcohol because the essential oils, as I mentioned, are soluble. They mix well in alcohol, so that will help dissolve them. Needle oils as well, like pine and such, can uh, also clog up the diffusers. You don't need to worry about, you can still use these with your diffusers. I use citrus all the time, but just be sure to clean them. Um, they do, can't call them humidifiers, but they certainly do humidify the air a bit, so as cold mist is going up. And also with ultrasonic diffusers, you wanna use just ordinary tap water. You don't want to use distilled water because actually the natural minerals in your tap water will help suspend those particles better in the air. Now, um, Tisserand Institute, again, has come up with some really nice, just general guidelines for safety of use with diffusers. You won't, I don't think you find these in the instructions on diffusers that you generally buy, but I'm not sure. I mean, I can't speak for all of them. And these aren't based on, you know, particular studies that they've done. Because if you think of diffusion, it's so, um, it's gonna vary so much in terms of how much you get exposed to, it depends on how big the room is, how close you're sitting, how heavy you're breathing. So it's really just a you know, great general kind of common sense uh, that they come up with here. So avoid directly an intensive inhalation, unless maybe you're seeing an aromatherapist that said to use it for some specific reason uh, for more than 15 to 20 minutes. You know, my, my rule is if I start to kind of get irritation or coughing, I've overdone it. Um, diffuse intermittently, 30 to 60 minutes on and off. I, I've actually been bad. I just sort of put my diffuser on and let it go. But I use very minimal amount of drops. Um, it will say on the instructions of, you, of the diffuser how many drops to add, but I would just say less is more. Less is more, you don't need a strong scent. And also uh, one of the ideas about kind of the therapeutic effects of scents is that they, it, we suspect that they may even work better when they're not continuous uh, because they don't register, probably don't register in our brain. If they're continuous, we don't notice them anymore. And if that doesn't make sense to you, just think about how, you know, you're cooking in the kitchen, if you're someone that cooks all day, um, you know, initially, oh, you can smell, it smells the onions, maybe using curcumin or whatever spices, you can smell them, but then you don't. Um, and then a guest walks in later on and they're like, oh my God, does it smell great here? And you're like, oh, you realize you don't even notice it anymore because we actually um, adapt and then we don't notice anymore. We don't smell it, so it won't have the same effect. So that on off may be helpful. Um, and ambient inhalation is much gentler, meaning like you just have that, uh, it's kind of like, like music in the elevator, just as a background scent versus intensely in the face. So just, I think less is more. Yes, we habituate, that was the word that didn't come to my mind. All right, and now, uh, I'm doing for time. DIY recipes, so do it yourself. Let's uh, get into the exciting bit. Now that you have all that your good background on safety, we can go to this last part here. So essential oils, I use them a lot. I love them. They're really versatile. Of course, you can use them for inhalation. Maybe that's the most obvious one that I've talked about. Um, now you you're inhaling them almost no matter what, no matter how you use them, even if it's for cleaning, because they are going to evaporate, but you can 
purposefully diffuse them. Just a few drops, you know, sometimes I even use three drops. If you've never done them before, try less is more. Um, certain essential oils just have a stronger scent than others. Um, I'm used to putting quite a bit of citrus into my cleaning product when I clean my floors, but the other day I tried geranium. And although I loved it, oh, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful flower. I put the same amount I usually do with my citrus and it was overwhelming in my place and I could smell it for two days. So the first time you try an essential oil, just go with less. Uh, you can put them in the bath and I'll show you how to do that safely. Uh, you can use them for cleaning. That's a, a great use uh, for beauty. If you know, like, so know what you're doing to proper dilute them and put them on your put them on your skin uh, and for massage. And I used to, I'd go to my own massage therapist and I take my own carrier oil with my own essential oils and ask them to use it on me. So for cleaning, sky's the limit. You can put any essential oil into your existing cleaning product. I say you've added it into your bucket, um, but there are certain ones that people tend to like to use for cleaning and air fresheners, and that's all the citrus. Uh, it's because citrus has, uh, got, it's high in what's called top notes in essential oils, which means the certain aromas that are uh, very, very light and tend to hit us very, very fast. And there's that citrus is very refreshing, and so we enjoy it. So I highly recommend trying citrus. If you're starting out, lime is my favorite. It may be very personal, but I love it. I even make a perfume with lime. Pine needle and atlas cedar are lovely for the floors. But you know, again, if you want a scent of geranium, you can try that. But citrus may also have natural like degreasing properties. And of course, essential oils, generally speaking, tend to have uh, antimicrobial properties. Um, no, we can't make particular claims on the bottles, but because in the plants, they deter bugs, so they will deter bugs in life too. Um, when you're cleaning and you're thinking about those kind of properties, just know that one of, one of the real tips for cleaning in general is it's called dwell time. So when you put a cleaning product, by the way, I have done a, I, I do teach a, a whole seminar called DIY cleaning products. So I know a lot about making cleaning products and I do it a lot. But when you spray something on your counter with essential oils or whatever it is, how effective it is at you know, uh, killing off certain bugs on that counter is not only doesn't only have to do with what's in your product, but how long you let it sit there, the dwell time. Just like, you know, during COVID, we were told to sing happy birthday when we wash our hands. It takes a certain amount of time for, uh, in this case, for the virus to be broken apart by the soap suds. So same idea when you're cleaning and with essential oils. Uh, spray, move on, spray somewhere else, come back and wipe after a while. Okay, side tip. Um, there is a lot of, especially if you're a beginner, a lot of great mixes out there. So you don't have to start trying to blend yourself. Look at all of these lovely mixes. We've got Morning sunshine, which I often diffuse when I wake up. It's got essential oils that are kind of peppy and get you going. Peaceful night that has those that are more relaxing, lavender, chamomile, lang lang. Okay, I shouldn't talk too much about this. So I gotta pep up, clear the air. Um, these have things in like eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is commonly used for congestion. So, you know, clear the air, clear the lungs. Um, smile for miles. Uh, a lot of citrus in this balanced with some warmer essential oils. We've got uh, focus concentration. And there actually are some uh, small trials showing some of these like a rosemary actually do help enhance concentration. So if you need to be studying and you're feeling a little sluggish in the brain, something like this and cheer up buttercup. You notice we lose a lot, use a lot of citrus. People just love citrus. Or if you want to bring a flower garden inside, got these many different blends. 
I can't really say which is my favorite of these blends because, uh, you know, that wouldn't, it, I would say, or I should say, it's sort of meaningless because it's such personal taste, smell. I guess it's not personal taste, but yeah, <laughs> personal taste of smell. Um, but if I had to pick one, Power to Flowers, maybe, I think it's just because it's called Power to Flowers. Okay, so I mentioned uh, using essential oils in the bath. So here are some general recommendations of dilutions, depending on the age. Uh, four drops for ages two and above. I just wouldn't use it uh, for any lower. Nine drops for kids and 13 drops for adults. And that's in a tablespoon of carrier oil. So how you can safely dilute them is you put, I use my hand. Uh, you have to really cup it and hold it, put a tablespoon of the carrier oil, put the essential oils in that, mix it really well with your finger, and then add it to the bath water. Now, you still need to be very careful about which essential oils you use in the bath, because what tends to happen is they just, you know, sort of float on top of the water and then all end up sticking to your skin. So, uh, suggestions, lavender, chamomile, frankincense, and clary sage here would be really gentle. These are ones not to use. And the reason I put here coconut oil and jojoba oil and not other oils, you can use any oil, as I mentioned before, they all work equally well to distribute the essential oil. But these two are less likely to make the bathtub slippery, which it can become, kind of stick to the edges and make cleaning hard. Uh, just the nature of those oils. So otherwise, though, it can be any. You can add essential oils into your existing foamy products because foamy products will also act well to distribute the essential oils. But I don't re recommend taking an existing product like your shampoo, adding tons of essential oils in and then, you know, using it when you want to because it's been formulated a specific way and you might disrupt that formula. So what I do recommend instead is take some out or make a little separate bottle or just as needed and put some drops in when you use it. Um, and do not use just sort of anything else if you come across online recipes for the bath with any of these sort of things, witch hazel, alcohol, aloe, um, milk, don't use those because they just don't safely dilute the essential oil. Uh, tea tree, there's a lot of, it's probably the most studied essential oil. I would say it is. It's the most studied essential oil, especially for different antimicrobial properties. It studies for acne, dandruff, uh, even that, that awful, you know, toe fungus you get. And um, so you can dilute your own tea tree if you want to use it topically, um, you know, it's often used also sort of first aid, you get a little scrape. You don't want to use it on open skin necessarily, but it's just kind of a, a scrape. But we do have these roll-ons that are already diluted for you and really easy to use for a little spot test, like a little spot use, like a acne. I, I used to use it a lot. I was prone to getting a little bit of acne here and there. And tea tree oil worked well for me and many of my clients. Uh, peppermint. So peppermint essential oil. Also have that in a roller just because it's so common for people to use it for headaches. And then you just have to roll on your temples here. Uh, close your eyes maybe for a minute because if some people may be very sensitive to it, again, the mucous membranes and just the off gassing. But uh, there, there are studies showing that peppermint oil helps with headaches. In the studies, they use you know, quite a lot and massage it into the skull. Um, but I'll put peppermint when I'm getting a headache here and then you know, kind of rub it a bit into my scalp and on my neck. Eucalyptus for congestion. This is a common uh, use. But as a, by way of a safety tip, a couple of things. One is one drop is all you need. And um, I, so how I usually do it is over the sink. I run the hot water. I put a towel over the sink to start trapping in the steam. And then I slip my hand in and I plug it at some point. So the water is in there. I put one drop of the eucalyptus in that water. And then I put my head under the towel and I breathe. I keep my eyes closed and I breathe 
heavily if I can for up to a few minutes if I can handle it. Now I'm a you know healthy adult. I don't have asthma or anything like that, so this is uh, perfect going to be perfectly safe for most healthy adults. But for younger children, so ages two to nine, you don't want to use eucalyptus. So I suggest instead fir needle and sweet orange, just one drop of each. And of course, you have to be careful. You can't just let uh, a kid put their you know head near something hot. So you have to be a little bit more creative. Like for example, you have a, you know, a bowl in the living room and create a little kind of tent over the two of you while you hold them where they can just breathe in there or something like that. But, um, uh, or maybe, you know, in the, in the bathtub, there'll be some off gassing if you add it into the water. So you got to be a little more careful. Uh, Everywhere online, I hear about rosemary for hair growth, so I had to mention it. I did look up the original study where this comes from, and I even contacted the company. They didn't answer me back. They don't actually give the dilution that they use in their product. It's some uh, uh, product, uh, I can't remember, somewhere in Asia. It wasn't in English anything, so I couldn't tell, but it's not just a pure essential, it's in some kind of carrier base. So I had to do my best guess. And um, so I'm uh, suggesting about a 2% dilution for the scalp. I want it to go low, it could go higher, but because this study showed these results based on applying twice a day for six months, I wanted to err on the side of caution and not make the concentration too high because it could maybe cause irritation. So that's why I came up with this based on my best guess from this study. My time. Um, in terms of essential oils and the, and the flu, uh, there are studies on all of these essential oils showing that they have in a Petri dish anyway, can effectively fight that uh, flu, or the influenza virus, but we don't know how that translates into you know, real life because we're not Petri dishes. Nevertheless, um, you could diffuse these. This is not like to replace proper health advice when you have the flu, but you could diffuse these essential oils in, in your house. And cinnamon and clove are actually in this formula we have called Nature Shield which is based on a, an old story. And you might've heard of a combination called thieves. This is basically the same combination of essential oil as thieves, just named differently uh, based on a, a, a story which may have some truth to it of some, um, they were merchants in the 1200s when they had the bubonic plague who apparently survived even walking amongst all these dead bodies and they didn't get sick. And the king called the merchants and said, you know, tell me your secret to how you survive this or I will kill you. And their secret was that they sold these, these herbs like cinnamon and clove and they used them and they somehow protected them from the bubonic plague. So that's, that's the story. Um, you can see I'm wearing tonight this, which I'm showing you here. So I, I just want to say that a personal inhaler, which you can uh, order them online, can be just a, a helpful way to have essential oil therapy on the go where you're smelling it. So if you find something like this combination of lavender or, and cheer up buttercup, helpful for mood. And I picked these specifically based on there are studies showing that um, lavender and some of these citrus oils can elevate the mood or be helpful for anxiety. Um, so you can do it on the go, you know, just before you go in for an interview or whatever it is that makes you anxious. Um, these are helpful and they can just be topped up from time to time. I did find a um, study I like to where there are studies on um, essential oils helpful for menstrual pain. and. The reason I wanted to show this one specifically is because there actually are um, studies that show when you apply something topically, it can help with something that is more internal, in this case, menstrual cramps, so that you know, yes, you don't have to take essential oils in your mouth to get them into your body. So uh, this recipe 
here is inspired by this review I read, and these were essential oils used in some of the studies that showed to be effective for menstrual pain. So you just dilute them and rub them on the belly. Uh, and here it's a 3% dilution. So if you see a recipe and you know it's a 3% dilution, you can adjust this recipe to any size container that you have uh, and know it's still gonna be 3%. You can adjust the amount of drops. Um, same here, upset tummy blend. Um, here's a recipe, again, to be rubbing topically of chamomile, tangerine or sweet orange, those are interchangeable, and cypress. Uh, so, you know, a little bit of digestive upset. Anti-germ cleaning spray, I wanted to include uh, one recipe here. So this is, could be any citrus really, tea tree for its antimicrobial properties and some hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and you can make a spray here. And I put shake vigorously because again, uh, there's a lot of water in there and the essential oils don't readily mix, but if you shake it up rigorously and spray, then it should do the trick. We have this blend outdoor living. So it has citronella and some other essential oils that obviously are meant to defend us against mosquitoes and such. It's not written on the bottle because we can't in Canada say that, but um, that's just, you know, essentially what it's for. So if you have a diffuser that you can plug in like out on your porch, you can diffuse something like that. Um, not gonna get into this tonight, but I actually have done, um, I have done whole trainings on how to make perfumes, but we have this on our website, this, a basic chart that you can use. It divides essential oils up into top, middle, and lower notes or base notes. And although you can make a perfume in any combination you want, the traditional way to make a perfume is to blend top, middle, and base notes of essential oils. Um, top notes evaporate first and you notice them in the more uh, kind of in your face in the moment. Middle notes are kind of a little bit more shy and later you notice them and then base notes, they tend to linger for much longer. So the combination of the three is considered ideal. So if you know which essential oils are top notes, citrus, no, no surprise that it's top notes. That's why we use it for air fresheners where we want that freshness right away. And you can combine uh, them with the middle notes and lower notes and experiment yourself. And they must be diluted, of course, in an base, an oil base, or in a high alcohol base to work well. Here's my recipe I call Sublime Perfume. Um, I've got my top note lime, a couple of middle notes, rose and jasmine, and base notes of vanilla and in jojoba. And I tell you, this is just, it is divine. Um, there's a lot of recipes uh, that you can find uh, now foods, all kinds of fun stuff. If you're into DIY, do experiment and you can just visit this uh, slash recipes. But here are some of them. Um, you can make a face mask with clay and rosemary and of course in the carrier oils. Uh, this one is my own, but I'm sure I stole it from someone. This is the easiest gift to make and it's lovely. You just get a nice container. You put either sugar or salt for something a little bit abrasive. Grapeseed oil, just because it's the less expensive one. Um, cacao powder or chocolate and your lavender and mix, you know, just mix it in. And then you can use that as a nice body scrub, not for the face, much too rough. Uh, vapor shower pucks are a hit. Anyone who's made these loves them. I haven't tried them yet, but I, I promise I will before I do another training. And I, ca I came up with some just first aid recipes for you guys if you want to use for cold sores, ear infection. This is rubbing around, never in the ears. Uh, arthritis, congestion, which I've already mentioned, the fur needle or eucalyptus, depending on the age, a small boo-boo, like tiny little cut, equal parts tea tree and German chamomile, and for the flu. Now I've put the dilutions for all of these so that you can, again, you can adjust the recipes. Um, 
but this is, a, for example, 5% dilution. So these are high dilutions. And as I mentioned, and as the Tisserin Institute says, sometimes for just spot treatments for first aid, we do use higher amounts. An aromatherapist might even recommend something higher. They might make something 10% or even 20% for, you know, but they really know what they're doing when it comes to what they're using and where they're using it and how long you're using it. So there's some... Uh, ideas with the warning, 5% dilutions are meant for small areas for short periods of time. And ah, that brings me to the end. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I wish I could see all your faces, but <laughs> um, guess what? This is question time now for those of you who have stuck around. Thank you so much, Tally. I'm so glad, too, that you talked so much about the safety and there's so much misinformation. So I really appreciate that. We have had uh, uh, some quite a few questions come in as you were talking, so I'll just dive right into them. Great. Uh, so first question, are cold pressed oils stronger than steam distilled oils? And then the follow up question was, do different companies process oils in the same way? Um, so the cold pressed oils, I'm not sure when you say uh, stronger, uh, what you mean in terms of be being sensitive uh, or more potent, because that's going to be more uh, based on the type of essential oil. Like I mentioned, um, cinnamon is, I didn't use the word stronger, but more likely to cause harm topically. Um how they are made might affect that a bit, but for the most part, it's more just about that uh, essential oil. So um, citrus, whether you made it cold press or diffuse, I wouldn't say it's stronger one way or another, but when they're cold pressed, they just have some extra bits of waxes and resins that makes them a little less uh, pure in terms of just being essential oils, but also actually makes their smell, rounds out their smell better. That's often why we, we use that method. And it's just much more, uh, I think it's just a practical way to get more out of the plant, less wasteful. So I wouldn't say one is stronger than the other. Um, the, the method that I, for the second part, the method that I mentioned, uh, distillation is by definition, that is the method for essential oils. Uh, you know, if you make them other ways, if you make them with a solvent, or even if you use carbon dioxide, that is not by definition considered to be an essential oil. So I think, and I don't know that much about all kinds of other companies, but I think by and large, most companies use the distillation. Uh, that is definitely the most common kind of true and tried method. And for citrus, I'd say the cold pressing is also the widely used method. There are some companies, I think, that dabble more in the carbon dioxide, which is not, again, technically an essential oil, but use that method. Um, and even within that method, there's different ways to make it. Um, and it's, it, I don't want to say like kind of what is better or worse, um, but I, one thing I would say is that if there are studies on an essential oil on how to use them and their properties, those studies are typically going to be on the diffuse version. And so we can't necessarily always apply what we know about essential oils to those ones because they're made differently. They will have different components. And some of those two are less pure. And by that, I don't mean they're like contaminated with things that are not from the plant, but they have other parts other than the volatile oils as well. So there's some issue in terms of transferring information from, but most of the information that you have and you learn about, like saying the textbook and safety, toxicity and use is on the traditional way to make them. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that, <laughs> it, yeah, but it makes sense, right? Um, thank you very much. Um, next question was, how can heavy metals come into oils? Uh, the, heavy metals are in in our soil, they're pervasive. So, um, you know, that they, even the idea that uh, if you buy, you know, buy or use herbs or eat food, um, if anyone suggests that there's zero heavy metals in anything, probably not the case because they're just 
they are in our earth and they will be in our foods. It's just a matter of, of dose. And for the most part, if the products are tested, we can be, um, you know, we can only find as many heavy metals as are the sensitivity of our testing. So it's good, important to have sensitive tests. Um, so it wouldn't be unusual for a plant to have heavy metals in it. But um, again, because essential oils of the way they're made with diffusion, because it only concentrates the light particles that can evaporate, heavy metals are fairly non-existent in most essential oils, which are made by diffusion, even if they are in the original plant, there's going to be some traces of, of uh, heavy metals. Thank you. Um, here's a question. This is a, I get asked this question actually a lot. Can essential oil be used in the dryer? Uh, um, so that's a great question. I have used essentials in my dryer and the dryer in my building for years. But I did learn a few years into it that, you know, essentials, like most substances, do have a, a certain point of heat where they can cause a flame. Um, that's why generally people who make candles and want scented say, you know, like, stay away from essential oils because they could be problematic. Um, so I know that there is a theoretical risk. My dryer obviously doesn't get hot enough uh, to cause any problems so far so good, but I do have to say that there is a theoretical risk and I'm not sure of what the, it's not something I've looked up, like what the temperature is, but you know, if you're uh, using your dryer and you're in the same room and not leaving it on and going, then, you know, it's probably fine, but I can't, guarantee that it's never happened <laughs> i haven't looked into it but i do put it yeah i put it on the um the wool balls uh, and i put quite a lot probably like 30 drops and on a few of them and throw them in and it's been fine but you know <laughs> just just to say that yes thank you um you may have covered this but i'm going to ask it because it's in the chat here are essential oils safe used long term um it's really impossible to answer that for any essential oil all essential oils in you know without any context so um you know with like that's like with everything or with most things that we don't have full information about which is so many things we don't have full information about uh a lot of things that we use, just then applying some, like learning some basic principles and just being, enjoy them, but being a little cautious, realizing how concentrated there are, I think is the, the best that we can do. So nobody would ever say, um, you know, don't walk out into your rose garden every day and smell it. Like what are the long-term effects? Maybe they would be, but, <laughs> but we wouldn't know. Just understanding that they're concentrated, uh, try to, as best you can, um, follow some of those guidelines. And there's been a long history of use of essential oils, and those general guidelines seem to have kept people, you know, generally safe. So that's uh, that's just sort of the best we can do. It's same as you know everything that we use and put on our bodies. We have toxicity tests, but we don't test things on people in high concentrations for their full lifetime to know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wish I could give a better answer to that. It was a really tough question. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you also, um, how you mentioned before, like you don't always have the um, the oil going all the time because you may not recognize it in the air. So you are essentially taking a break from it and then having it going again at another time. So, yeah, but that's a, that is a tough question. Everything yeah. else that is coming in is you're getting so much thank yous and, um, uh, people are saying it was really well organized, easy to understand. 
uh, a very beautiful event, formative, fun. So just a lot of great positive feedback. So you can't see it. So I just want to make sure you know that everyone's oh, really happy. Copy and paste and keep it for me. I would like to read everybody's comments. Absolutely. And you can also uh, watch yourself on YouTube because it will be here. So, okay. mm -hmm. but um, uh, I will send you the comments and I'll give you the link for, uh, so you can watch yourself as well. I wonder if there is a way for me to share the, um, I think it's the links to the websites of some of those um, useful areas that I mentioned, like such as the, the calculator, uh, the chart and that sort of stuff. Is there a way to copy and paste them? Yeah. Why don't you, if you put them into our chat right now, the YouTube or okay. the, sorry, the Zoom chat. And then I can copy and paste your info into the YouTube yeah. chat. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I should have thought that, that earlier, but there you go. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to put all of this stuff in our chat now for everyone else. Okay. Especially that, the yeah, the calculator and the carry oil, oil chart for those who want to make their own things. Um, I probably wouldn't make anything on my own if I had to calculate, <laughs> if I had to do math in my head about dilutions. <laughs> That would be, that would be exhausting. Okay. Thank you for sharing all that. Oh, no problem. I think it might come through. There we go. Oh, it might've been too big. Um, I will, uh, yeah, I will put it in for everybody and it, I'll probably just have to do it in little segments. Um, but if want, you can also reach out to me at uh, my email address, and that's abbotsfordnutrition at choicesmarkets.com. And I will make sure that you get the links that she's trying to share, but I'll have to just slowly put them in our chat. Like, maybe I can do it this way. Maybe I should have just put the, the, the calculator one, at least most important. <laughs> so let's try this it. again. Okay, here I go. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Okay. I just have to do it one at a time. So it will take me a little bit of time to do it, but I will transfer it over. And with that, I would really like to thank everyone for being here tonight and to remind you that you will receive an email shortly. And that is going to be the quick survey, um, as well as we're going to ask you for your mailing address. And that is because we want to send you the nutrition buck. And I am popping everything in our chat now. So there are the links. And if for future events, you can find those on our website at choicesmarkets.com. And I want to thank you all for being here. And thank you again, Talia, for sharing all this wealth of information. It was my pleasure.